and gentlemen, this is the next in our series, Remarkable People of Calaveras County, and we have for you today uh, a truly remarkable person. Uh, in all fairness, it, it ought to probably be two persons, but uh, uh, we're going because we're going to be talking with John Couts and he and his wife Gail, as uh, any of you know who uh, even have been living in a cave. Uh, uh, they uh, own Couts Ironstone Vineyards and. Uh, this has been, without question, uh, one of the most fantastic financial boons to Calaveras County that we've had. Uh, this charming couple that you're looking at right here uh, is the couple we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to, as we said, be talking with John about that. Uh, this beautiful picture taken uh, just recently of them. And John, uh, you've had a lot of pictures taken uh, over the years, but let's, uh, let's get back to uh, the beginning, if you will. Uh, uh, your parents, I understand, were immigrants, is that right? Uh, that is correct. My mother and father, both separately, uh, came to this country in 1906 and 1908, and um, both are of German heritage and had come the trail of many people in the Lodi area, which was the trail of Germany in the Rhine area to Russia following Catherine the Great into the Ukraine of Russia, and um, there they were farmers, and they had um, their own settlements. A Russian was only allowed to pass through in daylight, uh, their own schools, churches. It was 100% German communities. And from there, they came to Scottsbluff, Nebraska, which... Um, Talk about the end of America. There's the heartland for sure. A lot of them went to... Um, um, South Dakota, North Dakota, and but our parents went to Scotts Bluff. And well, coincidentally, my mother did too. You know, no, she was born and raised there. There you go, and well, that's where they grew up and um, got married and lived with their parents for a time period. Now, were they? Were they? Uh, was your father in farming at that time? Uh, yes, they've always farmed. Um, they worked for people, farmed, and uh, earned a living however they could. My mother tells me they used to travel over to um, Colorado and top sugar beets by lantern and live in mud huts just to uh, earn enough to keep going and start to get ahead. All right, a great, great beginning, a, a great historical beginning, not unlike uh, a lot of other uh, very successful uh, families, uh, not only here in California, but throughout the United States. Now. Uh, what possessed uh, your parents to move to California, and when did they come here? Well, they, they followed, um, again, the same trail. Uh, Lodi had 85% Germans that had come that same route, and they um, had heard about it. They came out and um, moved here in 1923 uh -huh. as um, a young married couple. All right. And was there a John Couts on the scene at that point? Oh, no. No, I, there was a sister and um, uh, actually two sisters and a brother. And I, myself, I came along as a latecomer in 1930. And we've got a great picture here, Paul. You're going to have to get a shot of that later, um, of young John in a, in a magnificent pram. And I said to Gail, boy, that pram is beautiful. She said, yeah, we sure wish we had it now. Uh, they'd have it on display upstairs, I'm sure. Uh, that's a beauty. Um, that looks like that came across on the, uh, on the uh, Mayflower or something. And so, John, you were born then in 1930 and uh, I suppose went to work at a very early age with your father. At uh, seven years old, I was milking cows and um, we uh, had a grade B dairy, so we uh, turned the separator and uh, churned the milk, sold the cream, and slopped the hogs with the, um, the rest of the milk. So we raised uh, pigs, chickens, um, actually almost 100% of everything that we consumed, we raised ourselves. Now how uh, does an immigrant, such as your father was, uh, get together enough money to be able to get into farming on his own? Well, in this instance, um, they had gone through the depression in um, the Waterloo area, just outside of Lodi, and he had earned a reputation of being a very hard worker, and the whole family was. So um, Farmers Home Administration had a lot of property that they took back during the Depression. Mm -hmm. And um, 
he was able to convince them that um, if they sold him this 38 acres for $13,000, that he would uh, someday be able to repay them. And he had uh, saved up $2,500, which um, was enough to build a house. And um, so we built a 1,000 square foot house and, and started farming. Well, John, uh, we're going to get into your portion of the farming in a moment, but I, there's one interesting, very interesting here of uh, you being uh, pinned, if you will, uh, with your Eagle Scout badge, and I believe that's your father pinning that on, on you. Um, was, was this something that uh, uh, mom and dad kind of expected uh, that uh, get into the American way of life, become a Boy Scout, that sort of thing? Well, I don't know if that was it, but um, I was very interested in scouting, and um, they, they literally wouldn't speak Eng uh, any German to me. I never learned German. They would only speak English. And um, I got into scouting, absolutely loved it, loved the competitiveness of it. And so um, I went through a number of scout troops as they came and went. Uh, Scoutmasters were hard to s come by. But uh, I had made a determination I was going to be an Eagle Scout. And so that's what I did. And I was very pleased to and honored to have uh, earned that um, award. And rightfully so, because that is, a, that is an impressive award. Anybody that has even tried to become an Eagle Scout knows how tough that is. And, uh, and that competitiveness, of course, uh, has stood you in good stead ever since. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of that folks will see as we go through here uh, that uh, um, was a John Couch trademark, if you will. Uh, you know, let's get it done and let's get it done right and so on. Um, Gail Couch came into your life uh, when? Uh, 1958. Uh, she was going to College of Pacific and um, I was going to the School of Hard Knocks. Uh, when I graduated from high school in 1948, I uh, immediately went into farming with my father and wanted to plant canning tomatoes. So um, we did and were successful that first year and started to expand our tomato operation. And then unfortunately in 1952, my father passed away. So at 22, I was on my own and started out uh, there. Now, were you and Gail married uh, at, at, not at that point? No, 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 uh, that was 52, and we actually, <clears throat> we got married in uh, 1958. Yeah, right. Okay, now, at that time, uh, uh, little did you know that you would be winding up with the operation that you've got here in Murphy's, uh, even though uh, Gail had family here in Murphy's, and uh, tell us a little bit about that. Well, actually, uh, Gail's grandfather was the mining engineer and ran Maloney's Mine. Ah. And so um, uh, her parents wanted to have a getaway place in um, the mountains. And her grandfather found the Kramer, what is now the Kramer Ranch. Um, it was the Schwer Ranch, which is right behind the hotel, right on the grade road. So that's um, uh, how... He, they ended up here, and she, um, coming from the city, loved the country. And that's why um, she spent all the time she could possibly spend here in Murphy's. So that it was most appropriate, uh, I guess, that uh, Gail married uh, a gentleman who was a farmer and wanted to be a farmer for the rest of his life. And we got a couple of great shots here, Paul, that we were, you're going to want to get a close-up of, because this is when John was named, uh, am I correct in saying this, Outstanding Young Farmer of the Year in California? No. Not quite. Not quite. Uh, this award came after some of our other awards. We were the um, uh, winners of the California Young Farmer Outstanding Farmer Award. And then this award was uh, the Outstanding Young Farmer of the Nation. Oh, the nation. So, yes, so Gail and I were part of the Junior Chambers Outstanding Young Farmer Program. Uh. So this, this was a um, wonderful award for us. Um, it was awarded in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, someone you probably know, Orion Samuelson. Oh, yes. 
uh, was the one that um, gave us the award, and he is still a close friend, and we watched him on the program this morning. Ah. Well, well, certainly. Uh, now, this uh, uh, is from the farm year. This is the California award, is that right? No, this is the same award yeah. uh, that uh, was taken um, uh, there in 1965. Okay, and uh, Paul, I hope we can get a shot of that one, too, because that's a, that's a beautiful picture. All right, now we're going we're gonna to segue a little bit. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, we, we do want to mention that uh, there was a terrific periodical or magazine back in those days called The Nation's Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And uh, who do we find featured in the uh, September 1966 edition but young farmer John Coutts? Right. Well, we were... In that instance, uh, <clears throat> part of the things that we had accomplished in order to um, get the award was um, we devised a whole series of new methods of um, actually growing kidney beans and a number of other crops okay. and a lot of new different equipment. Okay. Now, you mentioned uh, to me before we went on the air, John, that uh, your, your farm uh, in those days, in the early days, was considered kind of a typical American farm. Some row crops, some alfalfa, uh, some cherries, a few grapes, toke grapes, and so on. Um, tell us, uh, uh, rather quickly if you can, how the evolution then went from uh, that background to almost entirely now grapes, even though we're going to mention that you, are, you do have a couple of other interests. How did that occur? Well, that uh, was a transition that took place. We um, got very large in the tomato industry. Tomatoes, bell peppers, cucumbers. Um, in our row crop farming, um, we extended it up to where we were raising 2,200 acres of canning tomatoes mm. and 700 acres of bell peppers and uh, lots of other crops. 42 separate crops over the time period that um, we were farming. Now, excuse me, John, was that all in and around Lodi? Uh, in and around Lodi, and ultimately we'd gone south down to five points out of Fresno and um, were farming in um, about 150 mile square right. radius. Then um, I could see the light when mechanization came into tomato harvest. Uh, the fellows down in the in the west side of Fresno County in that area, when we planted 40 acres, they'd plant 400 as test plots. And so I said, um, uh, this is going to get tough. And we want to move back into the crops that we can be the most competitive in. And the two that were selected was cherries and wine grapes. Because our wine grapes in the Lodi area um, our outstanding quality, and there we compete with Napa and Sonoma and the coastal areas in the high rent district. I was a great monopoly player and loved it and always wanted to compete with Park Place and Broadway. So um, uh, that's what we did. We decided that we would go into premium varietal grapes. Uh, 1968 started uh, planting those varieties and planted the very first heat-treated Cabernet Sauvignon that came out of uh, Davis, out of Dr. Goheen. And those were a much improved uh, virus-free um, rootstock. So from there, we started planting um, Chardonnay. I planted 185 acres of Chardonnay, and there wasn't one single grapevine in the entire Lodi area. And it, um, it was really... Uh, a wonderful thing. We made a lot of money on it. For 10 years, we had the industry to ourselves in the Lodi area. Well, it seems to me that somewhere along the line, uh, White Zinn came, became a very important player uh, in, your, in your entourage as well. Well, all of the premium varietals, Zinfandel uh, and White Zinfandel, got uh, very popular in the uh, early 80s and <clears throat> went to uh, very high prices. But then, it, <clears throat> pardon me, it came back down fairly rapidly as um, a lot of people got into it. Because a lot of people did get into it, didn't they? <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, we, 
We went from uh, thinking of Lodi, the Lodi area, as a toque capital to thinking of it as a grape capital uh, of many different types of grapes, uh, as, as you've demonstrated. Now, uh, about what time did you decide that you wanted to become actively farming in the Murphy's area? Uh, and, and what brought you, other than Gale, of course, what brought you up here? Uh, surely it wasn't the A&Q. Oh, no. Uh, what brought us up to the Murphy's area was um, uh, we had made a decision to buy the ranch. Her father was selling it. And um, it was a beautiful ranch. We did not want it to um, get lost out of the family. Sure. So we went ahead and bought it, and then um, in order to um, own a ranch up here, you got to figure out some way other than raising cattle to uh, own it, sustain it, and keep going. So we planted um, apples, and we planted some wine grapes, and have been very successful with the wine grapes. Uh, the apples are fine, but the market's not very good. So um, once we had planted the vineyards, We've been always wanting to own a winery, and um, we were doing a lot of bulk uh, processing in other wineries, including Stevenau. Well, let's back up for just a second, if we may, because I'd like you to talk uh, with our viewers about what types of grapes you planted up here. And the reason why that's interesting to me is because I helped you plant a couple along with about 150, 200 other people one day. Tell us now about the different types of grapes that you have up here. Well, up here we have the same fine premium varietals that they have in the coast. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, um, Chardonnay, Symphony, Malbec, Petit Verdot, Shiraz. Uh, this area will grow any of those varieties uh, just as well as you can grow them anywhere. Uh, the interesting part is you'll say, where's Zinfandel up here? And we really didn't plant any Zinfandel here. Um, but um, we may go back to some somewhere along the way. In the, in the past, I've heard some people say, well, uh, Zinfandel grows better in Amador County, and some of these others grow better in Calvary. Is that, is that a wise tale? Oh, it's kind of a wise tale. Um, it's a little warmer down there. Uh, that elevation is mostly from about 800 to uh, 1,500 feet, and here we're much cooler as you can tell by the pines that are on this ranch versus uh, just the oaks that are down in lower elevation. So um, Zinfandels will do just fine here. And um, we had made the decision that we were going to stay with the ultra premium varietals and um, that um, uh, Zinfandel could be raised over in the Amador area. And we were just going to stay away from it for the time being. All right, now, now let's segue into this beautiful edifice where we are sitting today. Uh, many of us, thank heaven, in the Murphy's area, uh, were able to see this uh, from the ground up. And uh, it, it just, uh, unless you do see it or had seen it from the ground up, it's just kind of hard to imagine what wasn't here before and what is here now. Isn't that right, John? Well, that's for sure. Uh, in September of 89, this was just a pasture with a mountain, small mountain. And we knew the, the mountain was rock because it, uh, everything else has been washed away. So um, uh, we decided that we wanted to build a winery and a tasting room on this mountain. And the first thing we did is we cut the end of the mountain off, a uh, 70-foot sheer cut out of rock, moved the mountain over into the other areas. Nothing to it, but move a mountain to another area. Then we went ahead and uh, drilled and blasted out 10,000 square foot of cavern and um, put um, a waterfall in one corner and a music center in the other. And at first, if I can interrupt John, at first a good many of us who live here in the area said to ourselves, gee, John and Gail are just doing a great thing out there uh, for the community. We can hold functions in there. Uh, we can hold weddings in there. It's going to be a great place for concerts and so on. But you had a far more practical reason for it than that, right? Uh, that's correct. And uh, as we built the wine side of the business, uh, that got filled with wine barrels. <laughs> and that's really what it was designed for. Uh, a cavern will keep constant temperature at about 60 degrees, and it'll keep uh, high humidity. 
and the, without any air movement, so you don't get the uh, drying out of the wines as you do even in a refrigerated um, warehouse. So, because you're not using air to move the, um, the wine, or the air and the coolness. Now, when, when you built this, uh, again, those of us that saw it being built just stood with our mouths agape most of the time. As you said, you blasted this out of solid granite, and then you gunited it, as uh, you would gunite a, a swimming pool. Uh, and and uh, that obviously was to keep rocks from falling down and so on. Right. Uh, did that have anything to do with the maintaining the constant temperature as well? No, actually, uh, the amount of um, <clears throat> rock and dirt over it is what maintains that temperature. Okay. But the and it'll say the same if it's 100 outside or if it's uh, 30 outside. Now you store in there uh, for aging uh, only red wines or or red and whites. Uh, primarily red, but uh, we do use some whites in there and have done some barrel fermenting in there. Uh, the the um, stone there is actually calaveras schist and limestone. Uh, there's some granite, but not a lot of granite here. Now. Uh, as I said, f in the early days, uh, we did hold a lot of uh, events in there. Uh, those of us who are in the area can remember, oh, organizations like uh, VNA Hospice and organizations of that type meeting in there. Uh, you've had um, um, occasion to uh, uh, have some of your political friends, and we're going to talk about that in a few moments, uh, uh, on occasion in there. And then uh, I think a, a good many folks in the area said, well, John's all done now. He's got his caves built out there. That's all he needs to store his wine. And then what happened? Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, we'd uh, walk through the facility and say, well, we're going to do this here and that there and, and wave our arms and, and point at where we're going to do things. And everybody look at us and, yeah, yeah, it never happened. <laughs> but we fooled them. It did happen. It certainly did. <laughs> now, the, the next part of your project was to go up, was that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, we, we now have a seven-story facility and um, with the, this floor that we're on here in the caves as first floor. The next step was to build the um, wine making equipment and the uh, wine processing area, the uh, barrel room, the um, bottling room, and uh, then we moved on up and built the um, um, tasting room along with the music room and all of the facilities to handle people. All right, before we go, if you will, John, let's talk about some of the uh, events that have taken place uh, here on the grounds. We, uh, I know that Paul, for instance, uh, has some great shots of, uh, oh, uh, what, spring colors, I believe you called it uh, one year. You had weddings out here in this beautiful area uh, to the west of us. Uh, what other events uh, do you hold on the grounds out here, like, uh, for instance, the Civil War reenactment? Well, we, um, we try to have events as often as we can. I think we had about 300 events this last year. Everything from uh, cooking schools to uh, weddings in the park to uh, concerts in the park. Um, you name it, we'll uh, handle any size crowd. And uh, <clears throat> the thing that we set out to do was create the most beautiful winery in the entire world and the grounds are a very important part of that. So we've been building on those grounds and planting flowers. We have uh, 400,000 daffodils uh, that bloom in the spring. Uh, three or four. 400,000. <laughs> and we're planting more, and we're in the process right now of uh, planting a lot of poppies, California poppies, and, but um, our landscaping is beautiful. Parenthetically, you mentioned poppies and, and uh, uh, daffodils and so on. Uh, you also have a plan for the Highway 49 corridor uh, when it, with respect to flowers, do you not? Uh, yes, I do. <clears throat> our, our plan is to start in Mariposa and go to Downeyville and the entire route of Highway 49 to turn it back into the Golden Highway. And that uh, is going to involve planting daffodils in and out of each town, planting uh, poppies, and I own a half a ton of poppy seed right now that I'm uh, wanting to get distributed out 
through the um, uh, industry to get uh, on Highway 49 and around the, the whole 49er area. Probably the only man in the world that owns a half a ton of poppy seed. I can't imagine anybody else doing that. Now, John, uh, uh, again, because of the fact that it becomes an important part of this whole operation, let's uh, segue for a moment into uh, some of your political activity. Uh, uh, we know, for instance, that uh, you and Gail and, uh, and Pete and Gail, uh, Pete Wilson, uh, last governor of California, uh, have been very close over the years. Uh, how did you get started in the political arena, if you will? Well, we've um, been Republicans and uh, fairly active um, way back into the uh, younger days. And then um, <clears throat> I was um, privileged in getting the honor of being appointed by Governor Wilson as president of the State Board of Food and Agriculture for the state of California. And I've um, managed to be that. Uh, I am still currently the president until I'm replaced with uh, Governor Davis. Which may come shortly. Will come soon. <laughs> uh, we've got some great shots of you and uh, Gail and, uh, and Pete Wilson and his Gail. And Paul, you're going to get close-ups of those, I know. Uh, we've also got uh, a great photo here of you and the Bushes hobnobbing. Uh, what was this occasion? Uh, this was back in Washington, a very good friend of mine, Clayton Yider. Clayton was uh, head of USTR and later Secretary of Ag, U.S. Secretary. And uh, I'd had the privilege when I was involved with Tri-Valley Growers. I was chairman of Tri-Valley Growers for a number of years a very large canning cooperative, and uh, in that time period I appointed Dick Ling and Clayton Yider as my outside board members, both of them going on to be U.S. Secretaries of Agriculture, and that's how we got involved in the national scene. Okay, now, getting back to the state of California, we've got another shot here, and tell our viewers what this one is. You're obviously, you're up at the state capitol. We're at the state capitol, and this is my uh, board of the State Board of Food and Agriculture, and I'm standing on the end there as president. All right, so uh, you became active politically, you became uh, good friends of, of the Wilsons, of course, and, uh, and we've, that has become a very, very important part uh, of, the, uh, of the operation, not only here, but of your operation down in Lodi. Uh, you hold your big, wonderful birthday party there every year, and Pete and Gail are there, I think, Always, yeah, and uh, and this uh, this obviously is a ribbon cutting, and uh, and Pete Wilson is wielding the uh, scissors. What are we doing here? This is when we had the grand opening of our winery and tasting room in about 1995, and um, we opened the tasting room. Our whole family is in that picture, and um, uh, we were very proud of the fact that Gail and Pete would come up and do the ribbon cutting for us on our opening. Now, Paul, when you take a close-up of this, I want you to be sure you get the shot of the uh, medallion around John's neck, because that's a very important medallion and one that John and Gail are extremely proud of. John, what is that? Uh, we are part of the organization known as the Knights of the Vine, and um, Gail and I are both members. Uh, Stephen, our son, is, and um, I'm a supreme knight. And that goes, it's a French order back into the 1500s that uh, was brought to USA. And it um, is involvement in the wine industry and all of the things that are being done there. Another shot, to Paul, of uh, Pete Wilson and, and Gail Wilson, the day that, uh, that the uh, tasting room was open. Now, uh, we're going to do another little segue here, John, because you mentioned Knights of the Vine, uh, the French uh, um, award that uh, you have, and uh, a very important thing happened a couple of years ago over in France, last year possibly, I lose track of time. We did a, a show with your son Steve about uh, uh, the uh, wine that received the medallion in, Fran in, French, in France, excuse me, but some, some of our viewers may have missed that show. Tell us a little bit about what that was about and, and how prestigious that award is. Well, that's one that um, really put us on the map. Uh, in our 1992, we made um, our first Meritage, which is a wine made up of Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, Petit Verdot, and Malbec. And in the 
um, Vin Expo in Bordeaux, France. They judged 4,820 wines. Out of those wines, they selected 250 wines to get a gold award. We got a gold award. And, and we're thrilled with that, I'm sure. Absolutely thrilled. And then out of those 250, they select uh, 30 wines to represent the finest wines of the world. And we received that uh, honor as well. Unbelievable. Absolutely outstanding. Now, while we're on our little travel uh, adventure, uh, let's talk about this photo, uh, because this is taken in South Africa? Yes, this was taken in South Africa, and uh, it was one of our groups that were traveling. Uh, it was one of the places we, Gail and I set a goal of visiting every major wine grape region of the world. And um, uh, this was a part of that uh, trip. And uh, since then, we finished it up by going to Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. And uh, now we've, we've really visited every major wine producing region. And that has become important uh, for you. I know in some places, like Holland and Denmark, places like that, because your marketing uh, efforts there uh, are dramatic at this point. I believe your daughter handles that portion, does she not? We're very, very proud of our daughter. She came out of school, and I wanted her in the operation and uh, didn't know where to, uh, she would fit. And she decided that she wanted to do something that we were not doing, and that was export. So um, she started out all by herself, and uh, she is now in uh, 24 countries and sells a third of our total production out of this winery and uh, has hired a full-time person in Beijing, China, and is just doing wonderful. All right. Now we're going to bring folks back to Murphy's, mm -hmm. and we're going to go back upstairs and talk uh, a little bit about what you've done up there. Part of... Uh, Part of the charm, I think, of your, of your room up there, not necessarily the tasting room, but the banquet room, is the organ. And there have been a lot of crazy stories going on about the organ. Tell us the truth. Where did it come from, and how did you get it? Well, I've always loved music, and um, um, this is the pipe organ, theater pipe organ, out of the Alhambra Theater in Sacramento. Uh, it had been sold the, the theater was torn down, and um, a church had purchased it. And um, then they decided that it was too much upkeep, I guess, for them. And so they uh, ended up selling it. And we were fortunate to be able to buy it, bring it up here, totally um, restore it, uh, computerize it. And uh, so we now have been able to preserve the pipe organ out of the Alhambra Theater. Wonderful, wonderful. And after you got this room right directly above us completed, I think I'm right in this segue, John, mm -hmm. you, then, you then began work on the, what is the museum and the, uh, uh, the jewelry room, shall we call it that? What do you call that? Well, it is our, our museum. It's our gold country museum and um, representing the mother load and the gold country. And the um, um, thing that we are so very, very proud of and pleased is that we were able to buy and um, preserve the largest crystalline gold piece in the world. And it is, we actually built the entire building to house this um, gold piece because it had to be in a bank vault, which it is. And um, uh, it is a 44 pound gold piece. The next largest is the Frico, which is in uh, the State Museum in Mariposa. And it's 13 pounds. So um, quite, um, a difference. quite a difference. All right, if I wanted to buy this, John, first of all, would you sell it to me? No, it's, a, it's an art piece. It, it has uh, only its value as, is as, an, as a piece of art would. It, what we're so pleased, though, it was found nine miles from where it sits today. Amazing, just amazing. Uh, and when many of us heard that you were bringing that in, we said, well, there's got to be some catch. I mean, there, there's got to be a trick. I mean, that can't really be happening, but it, it did happen, and it's just a beautiful piece, and if you viewers have not seen it, by all means, get up here and do so. Okay, then, then where did we go in terms of the building of this 
facility after we had that room finished, John? Well, uh, the entire facility now is made up of the uh, tasting room, uh, an art gallery. We have in the tasting room the 40, uh, the 27-foot bar that came out of um, AJ Bumps in Freeport. Um, we have a 42-foot fireplace that's all rock, and um, we have. Um, tried to find antiques that we really liked from all over the world, and Gail and I have uh, brought these personally and brought them home by the truckloads. And you have, without doubt, uh, the largest barbecue pit that I've ever seen at any rate in there. Uh, do you use that? Well, we haven't really uh, used it very much because it, we've had not the need. We do have 3,500 square foot kitchen here, and uh, also our demonstration kitchen. And the, the real purpose of all of that is um, we want to bring people back to food and wine. Uh, wine is food, and so the pairing of it, uh, the, the consuming of it, enjoyment of it, is what we're really trying to show people how to do the preparation and use wine in cooking as well as enjoy it with the different foods. Uh, we currently have four outstanding chefs. Um, Dan Lewis is uh, just a superb chef, and we have a great um, pastry chef. So uh, we're very, very pleased with the um, food that we can put out and the, the schools that we put on for cooking schools. All right, now, the, I think a thing that's so important to me uh, and hopefully important to our viewers today is the fact that you and Gail immerse yourself so heavily in this community. Uh, even though, even though you know, your primary residence is still down in Lodi, uh, this community simply could not get along uh, without you and Gail, not only from the standpoint of what you do for us economically, but what you do for us with your own feeling about the community. And, and I, I know that you have a strong feeling. You've been a judge for me out at Miss Calaveras, uh, and we had a lot of fun doing that. You and Gail uh, are shown in this photo. Uh, you want to hold that up? Sure. Uh, as Grand Marshals of the Homecoming Parade here in Murphy's, and uh, that stamps you as uh, two of our leading citizens, certainly, because that's a, a very important parade. But in addition to that, you do things like uh, the Concours d'Elegance that's coming up again this next October. And tell our viewers a little bit about that, uh, uh, John. Well, this is, is, this is part of what we're doing um, on a fundraiser for the California 4-H. Uh, my wife has been, Gail has been very active in 4-H for years and years, probably, I hate to say how many, but uh, maybe, better from, many. maybe I better not, but from the time we got married, she's been very active in 4-H, and um, we've been doing fundraisers for them, and the last uh, fundraiser was the Concourse de Elegance that um, we have the, the, the poster here with uh, A.P. Giannini's car, personal car on it. Uh, we've been raising a lot of money for various funds and organizations, and we really enjoy doing community service. A.P. Giannini, uh, for those of you who may not be aware, was the original president of Bank of America. And uh, uh, to have his car up here is, uh, is a real feather in your cap. Now, uh, you, make, uh, you make Murphy's uh, an important spot on the map in a number of ways that I dare say most of our viewers are not even aware of, John. And uh, these three brochures are classic examples of that. Why don't you hold those up and tell us a little bit about them? Uh, this one is the Ford New Holland magazine, and it goes to uh, about 500,000 uh, distribution throughout U.S. and Canada. And they did a seven-page spread on um, the winery here, on our operation, and um, our vineyards, etc. cetera. Um, this was a great article and really gave us a lot of um, uh, international, national publicity. Uh, this is the Comstock magazine. We were on the cover of it as well, uh, Gail and I and our son, Stephen. 
and um, Comstock is a business magazine in the Sacramento um, area on up into the valley as well as um, Bay Area. And who's this beautiful lady? And this beautiful lady is our daughter and uh, daughter Joan and she is the one that has been doing all of our export and um, she I'll have to tell you, we were in London last year at the London Trade Show, and we walked through that trade show, and everybody in that whole show knows Joan. She, she is just one of those people that um, really makes friends, and everybody uh, loves her. Well, uh, again, as I say, I'm sure a lot of folks are not aware of the fact uh, that periodicals of this type go out, and not only across the nation, but across the world and uh, help uh, to put, as I said, put Murphy's on the map. Uh, what about a few other things that, uh, that you, uh, first of all, have been honored by? Uh, this was a, an article in the paper, uh, Fair Games Top Agriculturalist, that was the State Fair, and that was last year, Correct. and uh, a, a singular honor. Yes, that one is a very prestigious award uh, here in California and um, we were named the top agriculturist of uh, California. Miwok photo now hanging at Ironstone, this one says. Uh -huh. Tell us about that, John. Well, this picture was uh, taken in Yosemite <clears throat> in the very early 1900s, and uh, this lady that, uh, and her son, grandson that presented it to us is on the horse as a child, and her grandmother is there, and um, these were Miwok Indians, and uh, part of the, the people that uh, lived here at that time. So um, they presented us with this uh, picture, which we're very pleased to uh, put up in our museum and um, uh, keep the history of this area alive. Another article that I want to mention, John, uh, says John Couts named a tourism commission. Again, a very important uh, position and one that helps us up here, I'm sure. Tell us about that one, John. Well, I didn't need another job. But Especially but another non-paying job? Another non-paying job, because all of these are non-paying jobs. But uh, in this instance, I felt that uh, tourism in the, in the state has not recognized the uh, entire agricultural area and the gold country in what is there for tours to tourists to come and see and do. So I said, well, I'm going to go on this tourism commission for a time period and uh, in that process really try to get uh, a focus going on the gold country as well as on agriculture. The wine industry in the entire coast all over the state uh, is a, a huge draw for tourists from all over the world. And uh, our winery right here brings people in from worldwide. Because as we go to these trade shows and present our wines and we get the wine writers to come here and write about us, they also pass the word and spread the word on what is here. So I want this message to go to the Tourism Commission and actually ended up as treasurer and on the executive committee. So I'm, I'm going to be working hard on trying to get uh, tourism increased in this entire gold country. And uh, finally, along that same line, uh, out of the uh, Stockton record, or the record as it's now called, mm -hmm. Business Monday shows a toast of the mother load, wineries drawing power a boon for the entire region. And Paul, uh, you got to get a shot of this because there is no question that this winery is a boon for the for this entire region, not just uh, Murphy's, not just Calaveras County, but the entire 49er uh, highway. Uh, and uh, John, it's just incredible the job you and Gail have done to help make it that way. I want to close, Paul, by by telling our viewers. Uh, a few of the past honors that John has had that we haven't had t time to mention in the show. Uh, we said Outstanding Young Farmer in the USA, 1965. Uh, California Young Farmer, state president thereof. Uh, uh, Federal Land Bank Golden Anniversary Award, 1967. 
National Award winner Soil Conservation District, National, uh, excuse me, Ford Motor Company Farm Management Award USA, 1969, Lodi American Lutheran Church President, presentation of the Susie Bell case for Harvard University at the London Agribusiness Seminar in 1980, uh, Lodi Chamber of Commerce Agriculturist of the Year in 1980, and San Joaquin uh, County Agriculture Hall of Fame in 1990. Uh, John Couts, a very, very busy man. John, uh, I, I can't tell you how much in your debt uh, those of us who live in Calaveras County are, uh, not only yours, but yours and Gail, because obviously you two work as a real team. Uh, we're honored to, to have you on our show today. You are truly uh, a remarkable person of Calaveras County, and we thank you for being a friend of Calaveras County. Well, we thank you very, very much for doing this. Um, the entire family is involved in our operation, and probably the thing that uh, makes Gail and I the happiest is the fact that our entire family is in our operation and all working toward those same goals, and that makes us just proud, and we're really happy to be up here. Thank you. We're happy to have you here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, remarkable people of Calaveras County, you've just seen a visit with John Couts, and we hope you've enjoyed the show for our producer and director, and today our cameraman, Paul Muller. This is Merle Luckin. We'll see you on Calaveras Community Television. <laughs>